Thank you, brother, for sharing that. There is something. What do you say to something after that? That's, that is my mom and father. They tried and they trained and they labored and they prayed and they... And I struggled and struggled and I rebelled and I didn't want what they wanted for me. And uh, I would be back in the aisle of the grocery store. My mom would be going down the checkout and I'd stay way back because I didn't want to be identified with her. And I'd, she'd be occupied, paying the, I'd sneak on by and go for the car. And, and so, but they trained and they trained and they kept praying and and something goes on. I don't know all the theology about this, but parents, don't give up. Don't give up on your son or daughter. Keep praying. Well, my subject today is singles and discipleship. And is there something for the single today? Is there something for... Yes, the answer is unequivocally yes. There's something for you today. There's something for everyone here today. And single encompasses young teen, middle age, uh, uh, going up into, you know, well, you're single, you're not married. So there's a, there's a difference there. There's unique opportunities abound for singles. The labors are few. We just heard about uh, Greece. Need, there's 5,000 arrive there every day from the war-torn nations. They need people. Uh, singles can attend to the Lord without distraction. My wife said, I haven't had a complete night's sleep for over seven years, these children. And so there is something about marriage. You don't get your sleep. And, uh, and, but singles, there's something for you today. You can attend upon the Lord without distraction. That's found in 1 Corinthians 7. Um, Mary and Martha, you know the story. Those sisters. Mary comes to the Lord and says, Lord, would you ask her to help? Uh, uh, sorry, Martha comes and says, Lord, would you ask Mary? She, all she wants to do is just sit at your feet and listen. And, and she just wants to be with you. And would you, would you tell her to help me? we got soup to make and whatever's going on. Help me. And the Lord said, you know what He said? He said, Mary has chosen the good part. One thing is needful. She's chosen the good part and it won't be taken away from her. I want to talk very briefly today about uh, the thorns in our lives. I want to talk in my, uh, it's going to be 2 Corinthians 12. We're going to look at Paul's thorn very briefly. And uh, boy, I'll tell you. Um, um, yes, sir. Okay. Actually, I'd rather not even have that. I can shout for the recording. Okay. Thanks. You bet. Okay. I get, yeah. 2 Corinthians 12. And Paul said, lest I should be exalted above measure, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, messenger Satan, to buffet me, to pound me. Yes, I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought, I asked, I begged the Lord three times it might depart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength's made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, I'm going to glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches in necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. And I've been thinking about that and I've been thinking about the, uh, in the life of a single. And we're thinking about singles and discipleship today. And we're thinking about losses uh, in our lives. And all of us... Uh, have things that we've encountered along the way and um, maybe you have been rejected, maybe you're a sister here today, you were jilted, you were dropped and somebody dated you and went on and married somebody else and you've not gotten over it and, uh, and you wonder, what, what is there for me today? How am I supposed to advance the kingdom? And, 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 or maybe you're here um, as a young person and you don't like uh, those unchangeables in your life and uh, I'll list them for you. Um, uh, you can't change your parents. Uh, you can't change your physical features. They're trying with, with the plastic uh, surgery. But basically, you can't change uh, what you've been... Gender, your brothers and sisters, your birth order, your ethnicity, place of origin. You can't change your time in history. You're here. Your mental capacity uh, uh, and your aging and time of death. And does the, does the clay say to the potter, why have you made me this way? 
And then Isaiah says, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You're the potter. We're all the work of your hand. Psalm 139, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and my soul knoweth right well. And so you're here today, and what are we going to do with these things in our lives? Uh, the brokenness, the choices that we've made. How can we serve? Uh, and, and you'd say, well, I want to... I, what is God's will for my life? Uh, well, we do know some things. God's will is that you, uh, as a single, uh, it's very definite there, Paul uh, says this, that you uh, in everything give thanks. We know this is God's will, and we also know that you're abstained from fornication, you keep your body under, uh, keep, uh, keep folk, uh, keep, uh, ask the Lord to help us to, to uh, keep a, a temple that's holy for Him. So we do know some of the, the things of God's will in our lives. But are we actually taking pleasure in, in our infirmities, uh, in our reproaches, necessities, persecutions? What are we facing? Um, what difficulties are we facing? Are we okay with where we're at today? Um, the uh, brokenness that, um, that, that is in our lives. Well, I'll just tell you a brief story. When I was between the ages of seven and nine, I was sexually abused by uh, two different men uh, that uh, came into the community that my father was trying to reach out to and help. And um, uh, they came to our house because uh, my dad always had an open door policy. And um, so they came there and uh, my dad tried to minister to them, but through the process of, of all of that, uh, uh, and these folks uh, would say it, yay Jesus, and then and, and, uh, they took advantage of me. But, so that was a real point of brokenness in my life. And when I was 16, I was very close to committing suicide uh, two times and um, uh, took my brother's shotgun and loaded it and put it up to my head and took the safety off. And, and um, thank God it wasn't a hair trigger, but all I'd have to do is just... And, 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 and I, so, so the, 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 the confusion and the, the anguish and the, the distress and the, why did this happen to me? And Lord, where are you in all of this? And some of you that have heard me share my story before, um, all of us have a story. That's the point I want to say. We're all broken in some way. And, and God, uh, through the process of sanctification and healing and life goes on and God sends people in your life that, that help you, uh, uh, that disciple you. Uh, and we've all had those stories where God has... Uh, uh, comes and, and takes those difficulties and brokenness and makes something very beautiful out of that. And uh, so that's the, the, the point is, uh, are, are, we, are we using uh, our brokenness, our, uh, the unchangeables uh, uh, in our lives to, to, to reach out then and disciple others? And I think, uh, so it seems like it takes all of life to just get healed yourself. It seems like you come through a dysfunctional home life or uh, uh, whatever it is, and, and so, and you're, you're wanting to get married singles, and you, uh, um, yeah, you know, where do you start? And uh, two broken people come together, and, and uh, we really got to trust the Lord. And so, so I think about the story of, uh, let's, uh, you, you've heard the story of John Newton. We all know this. I'll just, uh, those of you who haven't heard it, um, very uh, ungodly man. He was a slave trader and going to the coast of Africa, bringing slaves back in those days, and uh, his men hated him because he was, he was just a real, a real um, a, a character. And uh, he went overboard in a storm uh, one time, and um, so the men were just going to let him go, and they had mercy on him, and they harpooned him, and they shot a harpoon and got him in the leg there, reeled him back on the boat. And um, John Newton said later that every limp, that as he limped, every limp was a reminder of the grace of God. So today, what are we going to do about our losses? Um, are we, we grieve them, singles, uh, and we, because God has, just think about all this work that has to be done in the kingdom, but God is using broken people to, to, to accomplish this, and there you sit maybe, and the years go by, and you're like, man, I just wish God would really make it. I, then I would know that it's him and God's speaking all the time and he's trying to get your attention. He's, he's saying, trust me and uh, let me use the limp that you have. Let me use the brokenness that you have. And like we heard today with Brother Dean, you don't, don't wait till you got it all together. By then you're ready to die, you know. Um, so, so, so step out in faith and let God use the, 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 uh, the brokenness and, and the limp that you have. The losses... Thank God for them. We, have, we, we must thank God for them. More characters develop through sorrow than success. 
And another quote is, adversity introduces a man to himself. <clears throat> um, if by your loss you've been instructed, you've lost well. And I like how Brother Claire Schnapp up there in the Northland says this, nothing is lost in God's economy if our response to failure is godly. Uh, that's been such an encouragement to me. So do we take pleasures in our infirmities today so that Christ might be realized, that His strength might be made perfect in our weakness? Are we waiting around singles when the field is white to harvest and the call is coming in real loud, but we're... We're waiting till we can get our acts together a little bit more. And, and God is providing lots of opportunities to minister. And, and we're still mad because of what we've been given and the hand that we've been dealt. And we're still angry about that. So, in closing, I just want to encourage us. Um, another thought I thought too, and, and I think this goes along. After this weekend, singles, when you go back to your congregations, walk humbly. Um, don't judge the folks that aren't as fired up as you are about the work of the kingdom. Um, I, uh, be an encourager. I, I had, uh, I've been in and out of my camp so many times, angry, and I'd leave and, and, and say, you guys aren't spiritual, and you've got to get with the program and start loving Jesus. And they just kept loving me and <laughs> they just kept saying, come on back. And, and uh, you know, you will get offended in brotherhood. It's guaranteed. He said you will. You're going to get offended in family. And so what are we going to do with that? So let's not judge the holiness of others. Or let, let's, I, I, I'll tell you this one story. One of our ministering, dear brother, he's actually uh, teaching me a uh, blacksmithing class right now. And um, we're, I'm loving it. I'm learning some of these old skills. And, and but uh, I hope he's not listening in on this. But, but anyway, I went to him one day and I said, you know, you're just not very friendly. Here you are, a minister. You should be more friendly. You should be reaching out to some of us people. And he kind of just pondered that. And, and uh, afterwards, I thought, man, eh. you know, he just kept loving me. And, and, um, and I said, your wife's not friendly either. I mean, <laughs> and, and, you know, God has such patience with us. Oh, we're, we get, we get, so anyways, when you go back to your congregation after this weekend, be gentle, stay humble, learn to serve, learn, where can I serve here? Don't judge them in where they're walking. Um, okay, um, in closing, I want to read something that the God has uh, touched me with, um, and this is by G.D. Watson. I don't know who he is. This is a tract called Others May, You Cannot. If God has called you to be really like Jesus, he will draw you into a life of crucifixion and humility and put upon you such demands of obedience that you will not be able to follow other people or measure yourself by other Christians. In many ways, he will seem to let other good people do things which he will not let you do. Seemingly religious and useful men push themselves forward, pull wires and work schemes to carry out their plans, but you cannot do it. And if you attempt it, you will meet with such failure and rebuke from the Lord as to make you sorely penitent. Others may boast of themselves, of their work, of their success, of their writings, but the Holy Spirit won't allow you to do it. And if you begin it, He will lead you into some deep mortification that will make you despise yourself and all your good works. Others, listen up men, may be allowed to succeed in making money or may have a legacy left to them, but it's likely God wants you to have something far better than gold, a helpless dependence upon Him that He may have the privilege of supplying your needs day by day out of an unseen treasury. The Lord may let others be honored and put forward and keep you hidden in obscurity because He wants to produce some choice, fragrant fruit for His coming glory which can be produced only in the shade. He may let others be great, but keep you small. He may let others do good work for Him or do work for Him and get the credit for it, but He will make you work and toil without knowing how much you are doing, sisters, mothers. And then to make your work still more precious, He may let others get the credit for the work you've done, making your reward ten times greater when Jesus comes. The Holy Spirit will put a strict watch over you with jealous love. 
And he will rebuke you for little words and feelings or for wasting your time, which other Christians never seem to stress over. So make up your mind that God is an infinite sovereign and has a right to do as he pleases with his own. He may not explain to you a thousand things which puzzle your reason in his dealings with you. But if you absolutely sell yourself to be his love slave, he will wrap you up in a jealous love and bestow upon you many blessings which come only to those in the inner circle. Settle it forever then, that you are to deal directly with the Holy Spirit, and that he has the privilege of tying your tongue, or restraining your hand, or closing your eyes, in ways that he doesn't seem to use with others. Notice Jesus' reply when Peter was more concerned with what John should do than with his own responsibility. What is that to thee? Follow thou me. When you're so possessed with the living God that you are in your secret heart pleased and delighted over this particular, personal, private, jealous guardianship and management of the Holy Spirit over your life, you have found the vestibule of heaven. If ye then be risen with Christ, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and our life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3. And lest I should be exalted above measure, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2 Corinthians. And Paul learned more. And I'll just end with this. Paul learned more from the thorn than from the third heaven. Whatever it is in our lives today, you're here that you're, you're single and you're wondering, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, why did this happen to me? Lord, what is the next step in my journey? We can be thankful for the thorn, for the difficulties, for the challenges, for where we've been. Uh, um, God, will, God will open up the door for the next step. God bless you.